And good morning, my brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. I appreciate you so much being here today. Those of you from Living Hope Community Church, Iglesia Esperanza Viviante, throughout the world. I know many uh, pastors from Africa have been tuning in. I just want to say God bless you. Thank you for supporting this ministry. But most of all, thank you for wanting to know the Word of God. That's what we're after. We want to obey all that he's commanded and that means we have to learn what he's commanded right that's how it happens so i thank you for your persistence in knowing or wanting to know more about scripture god bless you now today we find ourselves in acts chapter 17 a very very powerful moment in the book of acts this is when paul is in athens this is his second missionary journey he's come down from uh, Philippi, uh, he's come down through Berea, he's now in Athens. His guys haven't caught up to him yet, they're still on the way. He fled persecution in the uh, sequence of ending up in Athens. But now what does he do? He's in this big city, it's full of philosophers. If the Greeks were good at anything, they were good at thinking up ideas. Uh, and they like to stand in the squares of the city and discuss these great ideas as they went through their lives. Well, what does Paul do when he gets there? Does he go on a tour and take a vacation? No, look what he does. This is amazing. Acts seventeen sixteen. Now, while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. What happens to Paul? Hey, I see that these people are diverted by their idol worship. They are worshiping things that are not true, doing things that have no factual basis. They're leading themselves to their own condemnation, and I can't stand it. His spirit is provoked. A good question for us, when we see people going their own way and leading themselves to being rejected by God through their disobedience, do we feel provoked? Do we feel stirred up like, man, I have to do something? Well, Paul sure does. And look at this. He sees this happening. What does he do? So he reasoned in the synagogue. That's how he normally chooses to operate, right? He goes to the synagogue. And what does he do? Is he, is he trying to emotionally appeal to their senses? No, he's telling them the truth. He's reasoning, taking them back through the scriptures to show, to show that Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the Christ. Jesus has risen from the dead. Okay, he reasons in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace. Oh, here's another place he goes, into the public square. How often? Every day. Paul is not sitting in his hotel room enjoying life and waiting for his friends to show up. No, he's provoked in his spirit. He's going out to tell people about Jesus, and he's entering the debate in the marketplace with whoever happens to be there. He's going out there every day. Well, some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him. Notice we're given the fact that these two ideas of philosophy were present in Athens, and this is what Paul's up against. And some said, what does this babbler wish to say? They're calling Paul, Paul names already. They don't really even know him. Others said he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities. Well, okay, he's saying things we, we never um, have heard about before. But what's he doing? He's preaching Jesus and the resurrection. Now, just to give you a quick background, um, Epicureanism is this philosophy that came from a guy named Epicurus. He was born in 342 B.C., he said, everything happens by chance. Okay, we have a lot of people in our culture that adopt this same idea. Everything happens by chance. You're not in control. You don't have any idea what's going to happen, and there's no um, order to anything that does happen. Death is the end. There's no resurrection. There's no life after that. So what should we do? Well, we should eat, drink, and be merry because tomorrow we die. Pleasure is the end of life. That's all there is for it. We, we live to be please ourselves and enjoy ourselves. That's Epicureanism. Epicurus was the guy that said that. So Paul's talking to guys that believe that. 
Well, there's this other camp he mentions, Stoics. They were founded by a guy named Zeno. He was born in 340 BC. Notice these two were both born in about the same time. Well, in the end, Stoics, they think everything is God. They're pantheists. Um, everything is God, okay? It's really an interesting philosophy. Everything is determined by fate. I mean, again, it's almost like nothing really is in control. And, and they come to the standing of, I am the captain of my own soul. I'm in charge of my life. It's You can be all you want to be. You get to decide how your life should be. You effectively become your own God because you establish your own morality. Uh, you establish the direction of your life as if you're in control. You're subject to nothing and no one. There certainly is no higher power that's going to intervene in whatever choices you make in life. Does that sound familiar with the modern day world? Well, verse 19, it says, they took him, these are the philosophers, Epicurus and Stoics, they took him, they took Paul, and they brought him to the Areopagus saying, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting. So Paul gets promoted right into the middle of the philosophical debate. They want to know what he's talking about. Okay. For you bring some strange things to our ears, and we wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. There's a healthy curiosity. It may not lead them to faith, but they do want to hear it. That's great. Now, all the Athenians and foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. This verse just emphasizes the fact that this is what you do if you live in Athens. You go down to the Areopagus or, or the local corner and you talk about philosophy. Well, they were all about it. So when Paul shows up to preach the resurrection of Jesus Christ um, and who Jesus is and what his death on the cross is about, they are extremely curious. That's great. Praise God. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, now listen to this sermon. This is something. Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. Now, that's a great opening. I relate to the fact that you want to know God. He doesn't offend them immediately. He doesn't alienate them. He just tells them, I see that you guys are walking in a way that you want to know. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I also found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. This is really interesting. I mean, these guys have so many gods that, that you know, they've named Zeus and, and whoever, all of them. Uh, and they worship all of them in their own way. But then they say, well, what if we miss the God? What? I mean, we've got all these hundreds of gods around us, but what should we do? Maybe we missed one. Very, very superstitious, right? In the end, they say, well, okay, let's, let's make a statue of an unknown God, the one we can't figure out, and we'll worship him too, just in case. Cover all our bases. <laughs> well, Paul picks up on that, and he uses that to bring them into the discussion. Hey, you guys have this unknown God over here, the one you don't know about? Well, I'm going to tell you about him. Let me tell you about this unknown God, because I know about him. I'm going to proclaim him to you. And what does he say? The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man. Now just think of the significance of this. Paul is telling them what? Hey, you guys believe everything happens by chance. You believe that death is the end of life. There's nothing beyond it. One of you says you're going to live for pleasure. The other one says you control your whole life. Well, listen, instead of you making your own God, God made you. He created everything. And you know what? He's Lord of heaven and earth. We're all accountable to him. He doesn't live in temples made by men. You think these buildings hold your gods? That's not the unknown God. The, the God of reality, the true God, he doesn't live in temples made by man. You can't just go get your woodworker or your 
a mason to make a god. That's not how it works. There is a god that's beyond what you can make. Nor is he served by human hands. This god is what the theologians call transcendent. He is above us. He is beyond us. We, we can't control him, right? As though he needed anything. Like you guys offering these things to your pagan idols is doing anything. It's doing nothing. The God that's real doesn't need offerings like this. Since he himself gives all mankind life and breath and everything. Just sit back and think about what he's telling these philosophers. You guys think you're in control of your life? Well, listen, there's a God who is transcendent, who gives you life. He gives you everything you have. He provides for you every, in every way, even though you don't recognize him. And he said to them, And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of of their dwelling place. God's completely in charge. God created man. God is the one who controls and determines history. God is the one that is real. Wow. Praise God. That they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. And here, look, he's not just transcendent so far beyond us, yet he is actually not far from each one of us. He's imminent, is what the theologians would call that. He is with us. So he's not far from us, and yet he's completely beyond us. Okay, he's the creator. We don't create him. He creates us. Uh, he doesn't serve us. We serve him. He's completely in control of all of creation, including history. This is what Paul proclaims to these pagan philosophers. And he says, for in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone. Look at this. He's, he's completely wiping out their idolatrous intention. Right? You think your God is that statue over there or that picture or that... Um, carving. No, God isn't made of gold or silver or stone. He's not an image formed by the art and imagination of man. You guys who are pursuing these idols are absolutely pursuing the wrong way. God is not there. He's transcendent. He's imminent. He's the creator. He controls it all. We answer to him. We are accountable to him. He's not made of gold or silver or stone or something that you could think of. Instead, we're told what the times of ignorance God overlooked. But now what does God do? He commands. What does he command? Well, he commands all people everywhere to do what? To repent. What's Paul telling them? He's saying, look, you guys think you're in control of all these gods and, and you're, you can make one if you want to make one. You can't make the real God. And not only can't you make the real God, but he commands you to do something. You are under his authority. You have to give an account of your life to him. And what does he want you to do? He wants you to repent. He wants you to turn away from your evil and yield your life to him. That's the message of repentance. Turn away from those things that you do that God hates. Okay, because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness. This God that you don't seem to know about is a God who's not only real, but he's telling you to repent because he's not only created you, he's not only provided for you, he's not only well beyond you, but imminently right with you, he is also your judge. There is a day he's going to judge the world in righteousness. And he's going to do it by a man whom he has appointed. Who's that? That's Jesus. And of this, he has given assurance to all by doing what? 
by raising him from the dead. His world has been conquered by the Christ. He's going to judge us by raising Jesus from the dead. He's going to bring us to account. And hey, you Greek philosophers that think you're in control and should just live for pleasure, or you captain your own ship, you are going to face this God. You are going to be accountable to him. Wow. Here's what they say. Now, when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. Well, that's still true even in our culture today. Some people just say, forget it. <laughs> You're crazy. But others said, we would like to hear you again about this. Okay, so some of the curious people are still curious. So Paul went out from their midst. He, get, he delivered his sermon and he left. This is one of the few occasions where he wasn't beaten for his opinion about who God is, right? But as the passage ends, it tells us something very important. But some men joined and believed. In other words, they listened to Paul's account of this unknown God, and they said, you know what? He's the real God. We don't need to add him to the pantheon of gods we already serve. We need to serve this God and him alone, because he is the true God. He is the one that we will be accountable to. Wow. That's great. They came and they believed. So now we see that a church is now formed in Athens through the preaching of Jesus as the Christ and the Messiah, through the preaching of his resurrection from the dead, among whom also were Dionysius, the Arab, the Arab, <laughs> Arabagite, I'm sorry, I have trouble with my Greek names, and a woman named Damaris and others with them. This is a challenging passage for us. Paul stands up to the philosophies of Athens and delivers the truth. He delivers it in a way where they'll listen to him. He's not completely offensive. He relates to them by saying he's going to tell them about the unknown God. But nonetheless, he delivers the truth. And in some cases, people mock him. In some cases, people want to hear more. And in some cases, people believe. What's our calling, church? We go deliver the gospel by the grace of God through the power of his spirit. And where does that lead us? It leads us to a place where God provides the increase through what he uses us to do. That's what Paul's demonstrating. Go do it. Praise God for you, church. Serve him well today.